Hello, I'm happy to talk today to Dr. Indu Submaranian, a clinical professor at UCLA and director of the Patrick Center in Los Angeles. Um, I am a neurologist in Saratoga Springs, New York, and we will be talking today about Indu's new paper on childhood trauma and Parkinson's disease. So welcome and thanks for taking the time. Thank you so much for letting us highlight this important topic. Yeah, so, you know, there's many papers published every month on Parkinson's disease, but this topic uh, is uh, standing out and uh, not a thing that has been commonly looked at. So let me just ask you, what gave you the idea to study this? Yes, I mean, I think, Catherine, you and I have been looking at things that can inform us uh, about our patients, um, the person who's standing in front of us when they come in and we're giving them this diagnosis. And I think that so much of what we've done is just this cookie cutter approach to sort of giving everybody the standard treatment. It doesn't matter if they're a man or woman. It doesn't matter if they're a veteran. It doesn't matter if they, um, you know, maybe from a minoritized population. I think that, you know, customization is so key. And I think that we're realizing that we really have missed the boat a lot um, through the pandemic and in healthcare in general. Um, we've also been interested in, I think, approaches that are outside the box, right? So we have this integrative medicine background, lifestyle medicine background, and I've been going to those meetings and really been struck by how much trauma, um, you know, uh, evidence there is mounting about the importance of um, things like uh, early childhood adverse events um, and, you know, what uh, zip code you live in, what your um, pollution index is, you know, how these things can all affect um, how people are living uh, through their life and, and their health. So I think that it is high time as a neurologist that we have paid attention to this. Um, there's been mounting evidence throughout um, many disease states. Cardiology probably is much more advanced, um, uh, you know, um, various types of prevention of cancers and things like that, uh, mental health. But we really haven't had much data at all in neurology. In fact, I, I think when we went to write this paper, there were just one or two papers that were looking a little bit at MS, a little bit at you know general neurological issues, um, but really nothing in Parkinson's disease. And I think that we um, know that this is a disease that's not just a motor disease, it affects mental health, it affects non-motor issues. And so of course, much of this um, childhood adversity should um, can can be obviously, you know, I think invoked in some way um, to show how people may progress or how quickly they may get the disease and, and then how it manifests in them um, in a disease like Parkinson's disease. So that sort of was was the um, sort of framework, um, going to meetings. And then as we wrote this paper, um, and we're, we're sort of in um, uh, various ed ed editor ed editing stages, there was a beautiful paper that came out by um, Nadine Burke Harris and, and team that really was a call to action um, in for neurologists and, and caring about trauma. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's really, I think, an under-recognized issue. And, you know, with my own background being very interested in functional movement disorders, psychosomatic disorders, and so on, it there's more and more, uh, it becomes more and more evident how common a trauma background is, not, not only uh, for uh, people we were traditionally asking about. So why don't you summarize your findings for us? Sure. So this is a web-based survey. So obviously, you know, these are patient self-reports um, of their disease, um, but we, we have a large cohort of people that we've been following over seven years, um, looking at modifiable variables um, and what really impacts Parkinson's. Some of the, uh, our previous papers have looked at diet, exercise, um, things like loneliness. Um, this is the same cohort. So we ended up putting the ACEs uh, questionnaire, which is 10 questions, looking at, you know, were you exposed to certain things in your household um, below the age of 18? Um, this is a relatively standard questionnaire that's you know administered one time and you get a score out of 10 and um, this is something that you know has been pushed uh, at least in the state of California as something that we should be checking more in all people coming in um, and so we thought that we would look at it so we put this we, we introduced the survey and um, we found we didn't force everyone to take it and unfortunately you know there was a 20 percent or so of our patients um, you know who answered did not I choose to answer these questions and one has to ask who are those people that didn't answer the questions are they the ones that may have had trauma these questions were triggering them you know it was something that we we it was a gap you know um, we didn't we didn't add extra questions um, about why people didn't um, answer those questions but you know in the folks that did answer um, and we have to also put this in context we have um, a patient population that's largely quite um, affluent 
people who are able to access um, you know, web-based surveys through their computer, largely Caucasian cohorts, um, and uh, not a lot of minoritized populations in our, in our cohort, and we want to do better with that. Um, and uh, we actually do, are able to gather a decent amount of women, actually. We, we represent women quite well in our survey, and I think that's because of this online approach and some of the things that we're studying. And so in our survey, we, we really looked at, we broke it down into um, people who had zero, one to three, ACEs and then four and above. And these are sort of this um, standard way that we break down ACEs and other um, sorts of ways that we're able to um, kind of categorize um, what to do with patient populations. And what we saw, and it's preliminary evidence, I think it's, you know, um, I, I told you some of the limitations, is that in people who had higher um, ACEs scores, um, they uh, seem to have um, more uh, severity, um, symptom severity, um, when um, we, we control for things like years um, since diagnosis, um, age, gender, things like that. Um, and they also seem to have a worse quality of life. And there was some indications that there was more um, things like non-motor issues in those populations, as you might expect, things like anxiety, depression, um, you know, things that affect, you know, presumably um, ACEs can affect um, separately anyway. So there are some confounders, but I think we, we really want to um, sort of use this as the first piece of evidence to hopefully pave the way for caring about um, trauma in Parkinson's disease um, moving forward. Thanks so much for that summary. And you already mentioned uh, basically the, the main uh, methodology you used. So Bert, what is kind of the next step for you? How do you see this, um, these findings informing our clinical care? Do you have suggestions for um, all of the neurologists listening in this regard? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, Dr. Burke Harris, she was the uh, former uh, Surgeon General in California. She's a woman of color, a brilliant speaker, um, and she had basically worked in inner cities, I think in San Francisco, working with young, uh, you know, pediatrics populations, seeing these effects of adversity in that time frame, and really hoping to change, you know, sort of, you see this population at risk, and then you're following um, this cohort that we knew from the Kaiser cohort uh, determined, you know, earlier uh, morbidity and mortality um, in, across a number of disease states. We're seeing things like um, more heart attacks, um, more, um, you know, diabetes, all kinds of things in these populations. And this is old data. I mean, this is not new news. We really just have not been focusing on this. Um, and, and so in her paper, this call to action, they had talked about, you know, some ACEs related conditions that are, don't, currently are not including Parkinson's disease. So there's three ACEs related neurological conditions that people should be aware of. Uh, one is in the headache, you know, pain universe. Another is in uh, the stroke universe. Um, and that's kind of understandable given cardiovascular risk factors and things. And then the third is really in this um, dementia risk um, category. And I think Parkinson's disease, as we know, can, um, you know, be associated in, in a large percentage of our patients um, get demented. So, um, but we don't have Parkinson's disease called out in, in this sort of, you know, framework. And what people are talking about is really, um, you know, if you have uh, no ACEs, um, you know, or this middle category of one to three, and you're not an ACEs-related um, diagnosis, uh, which Parkinson's disease is not at currently, that we just give some basic counseling about the importance of lifestyle. I think we love to see that anyways. So they're talking about things like, you know, um, exercise, diet, uh, sleep, um, social connection, getting out in nature, things like that. So just general counseling on the importance of that. Um, but then if you're in this higher risk sort of category, and so with these ACEs related neurological conditions, so uh, dementia, the headache gang, and the stroke gang, if you're, you have this middle range, one to three, they're really getting additional resources. And so some of them may be, you know, referred for social work, help or mental health uh, support and things like that. And I'd really love to see that happening in uh, Parkinson's disease, because I think we have so many needs in our population. And I'm always uh, hoping to advocate for more mental health needs that are scarce and resources um, in the social support realm, because I believe that social connection and social support is a huge buffer for this trauma, um, you know, that, that we, we're seeing. Um, and ACEs is just one type of trauma. I mean, I take care of veterans in the VA. We have some, um, some information now coming out about post-traumatic stress disorder, predisposing to certain things in Parkinson's, possibly head injury, different types of things like that. So I think we have populations at risk 
that we can hopefully screen um, at intake. And I'm really pushing for that. So trying to meet somebody, understand maybe um, maybe it's not the neurologist that does this intake. It might be someone else on the team that can spend some time doing these questionnaires. Understand, you know, does your patient have a high ACEs score? And unless you ask, many patients don't necessarily come forward to talk about this. And so I, I really am pushing for trying to screen, trying to advocate for more research in this area so that we can really classify Parkinson's disease as an ACEs related condition and thus give more resources um, that are limited like in the mental health world and um, also in the social support world to our patients. Thank you very, uh, very many important points. And I think uh, it's a very important thing to recognize that it's not just the trauma in the childhood, but also throughout life, as you said, and might really influence, especially non-motor symptoms on Parkinson's, including anxiety, including pain that are often difficult to treat. So I think there's much more to, to do in, in both research and advocacy and education, right? We wanna educate patients about this, but also educate other neurologists and providers, I think, um, you mentioned that trauma-informed care has really uh, seen its or is getting its spotlight in primary care and, and other specialties, but I think we, we have catching up to do in neurology, and I think this is a really important work towards that goal. So thank you so much uh, for your work and for taking the time to um, uh, sharing your thoughts, and I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you so much, Catherine.